we are live. So welcome everyone that's with us here today. Um, I'm Maisel Beek, uh, the Programs Manager at Warehouse 41. Um, and I am both happy and sad to say um, hello in this final, the last but certainly not least, public talk uh, as part of our curatorial development colloquium. Uh, the colloquium, the curatorial development program in general has been in partnership with the incredible Bombay Institute for Critical Analysis and Research, BICAR, and has been titled Future Perfect, Catastrophe and the Contemporary. Um, the colloquium over the past few months has brought together curators, artists, and scholars to flesh out the contemporary along a Mobius strip of past and future, of distance and proximity, absence and presence, catastrophe and creation, and displacement and condensation of time and space in the historical landscape of modernity. Today, we are going to hear from Rohini Devashar, an artist and amateur astronomer who in her practice has chased solar eclipses, which she calls literal dialectics of negative and positive. During the session today, Jessica Almal, one of the, our colloquium participants, will be introducing Rohini and leading the discussion following Rohini's talk. Briefly, Jessica is a multidisciplinary artist with a practice that engages through social interaction, critical and historical research, as well as speculative future imaginaries. So without further ado, Jessica, you have the floor. Yes, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be uh, leading the discussion today. We're joined by Rahini Devesha, trained as a painter and printmaker, working with video and cyberstatic drawings. Um, the research focuses on twin aspects of the Earth's skies, its celestial constants on the one hand and the mutable objects of the atmosphere on the other. And Rohini is also the co-founder of Splice, an artistic and curatorial collaborative practice, which I'm so interested in hearing about. So um, I'll hand over to Rohini now. Thank you so much. Hello. Hi, thanks so much. Thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you to the House 41, to the car, Maze, Rohit, Sonali, Kunal, Shama, and Jessica as well. I really enjoyed um, all the talks so far, and I'm very happy to sort of close the colloquium and to be with you this evening to think about ways of looking at and interrogating the contemporary catastrophe and the future. Right? So one of the questions I was thinking about through much of the conversations was, what does it mean for the artist faced with the catastrophe, right? Uh, and in 2019, Kevin Jones, who was a curator based in Dubai, whom some of you may know, had invited me to speak at a panel, the title of which was Artists and the Apocalypse. And he had sent us a prompt, which I would like to share with you today. Uh, this was from an article uh, by the writer Ben Mock in the Paris Review in 2016, where he revisits the history of apocalyptic art through an exhibition which was titled Distant Hammers. And it was the work of Patrick J. Reed, an artist from Iowa who lives and works in Germany. And I'm quoting from uh, his exhibition, from the review. Distant Hammers confirms the suspicion stated earlier that apocalyptic art is no longer visionary and can't be. The apocalyptic, apocalyptic moment in our culture is no longer visual, so no vision can hope to prefigure it. The scientist has replaced the artist as the figure responsible for articulating the conditions of the apocalypse. Its shape can only be measured, not seen. And even if the apocalypse could be visualized, it's too late for visions. The end has already happened. So what I hope to do this evening is obviously work against this uh, slightly. Uh, also by thinking outside the construct a little bit and thinking through two specific frames, horror and wonder, and then working towards a kind of strategy a, a strategy of the strange or more specifically the act of stranging. So I'm just going to set the frame or the stage a little bit. I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. One second. Yeah. So I'm just going to set the stage a little bit for those of you who maybe don't know that much about my background. Um, as both Mays and Jessica have already mentioned, I am an amateur astronomer as well as an artist. And 12 years ago, I began a project which was with amateur astronomers in Delhi. And uh, it began as a sort of a form of collective investigation, stories, histories, 
conversations coming together in a sort of slowly building chronicle of this almost obsessive group of people whose lives have been transformed by the night sky. And as an amateur astronomer and an artist myself, this was also an exercise in trying to work out where I positioned myself within the material and also where possibly astronomy fit in within my own practice. And as part of this research, I've traveled across the country with amateur astronomers, usually each trip focused on a stellar event or a site. Now, all of these trips have been really extraordinary and these sites hidden away as they are from most civilization, far from cities, etc., are almost symbolic of the people who are drawn to them. And as this work has developed, I've become increasingly conscious of the role of observation, the field, the site in my work. And I found these modes to be very useful in the exploration of the relationships between the human and the non-human. Um, you could say nature and culture, but I prefer to think of it more as human and non-human. In 2016, I was invited to be part of a show which opened at the Spencer Museum of Art in Lawrence, Kansas. And while I was there in Lawrence, I tracked down and managed to interview a group of storm chasers. And I was interested in what these two very different groups of people, one so enthralled by the night sky and the other by extreme weather, might tell us about the nature and meanings of, uh, sorry, the nature and complexities of meaning making. So how do we construct our environment? How does that environment in turn construct us? Because amateur astronomy is as much an encounter with the self as it is an experience of space and horizon. And similarly, weather, because of its scale, provides an almost sort of mythic realization of oneself within an environment. So to begin, I'd like to play a sound piece, um, which is just one very small part of a large, large body of work. Um, but we could spend just the whole hour and a half listening to them, but we won't do that. Um, these are voices from these two communities. And I'm just going to, yeah, it's, just let me know if everything is. I looked at that eclipse and I said, God, that's me. Because I had never seen such intensity in black. I'd never seen uh, the black of the moon with the corona on its side was speaking to me far more than the, 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 the grandeur of the corona. It was, it was telling me in uh, its intenseness about how I felt, but how I cannot say it. It 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 helped me um, suddenly find articulation. Um, I, I am an eclipse chaser, and I'm an eclipse chaser because of my love of eclipses. I'm an astronomer by profession, but an eclipse chaser by choice and by hobby. It, it helped me um, suddenly find articulation. Um, I, I am an eclipse chaser, and I'm an eclipse chaser because of my love of eclipses. I'm an astronomer by profession, but an eclipse chaser by choice and by hobby. I'm not really a solar astronomer. That's not my field. Um, and my, my passion for eclipses started in 1970, when I was 14 years old. And I thought I was well prepared for this event. And uh, we set up in the middle of a football stadium, a nice view of the sky. And when the moon shadow came over and when totality started, I had a well-rehearsed, well-practiced photographic program I was gonna do and when I was gonna use my telescope and when I was gonna use my binoculars. And I just stood there literally awestruck, just binoculars hung around my neck the telescope stood there and I just stared up at the sky for two and a half minutes. I couldn't move. I was just stunned by the event purely from the aesthetic standpoint, just the beauty and the awe and, the, and the, just the magnificence of the view. It was not at all as I had read in all of these books describing the phenomena of the, of the corona and the prominences, just the, the majesty of the, the, the spectacle of it, which you can't describe to somebody. You can talk about it, you can take pictures, you can show today videos, and you can't capture it, you can't explain it. It's something you have to see. The chase that bothers me the most, this was Joplin, Missouri, 2011, is that right? 
Okay. Uh, so this was a day in which uh, there had been several messy supercells down in southeastern Kansas, and generally what happens is the first couple of storms that go up in the day are the, the type of storms that all the storms will be that day. So we go east and we meander through and we, and we end up northwest of Joplin and there's a tornado warning on this mess behind us, but there's been tornado warnings for hours. Nothing has actually happened. It's just it's still this mess of storms. We come south through Joplin and I suddenly see John in the car in front of me, in the passenger seat, beginning to start doing this, you know, t screaming, at, screaming at, at Sean. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And then suddenly I hear over my weather radio that a large multiple vortex tornado has been decided just west of Java, and which is like off to my west. And, I, and it's so messy still, I just see blackness. That's all I see, just a wall of black. I see nothing. So we drive south um, with, with now some motivation to get out of Java. And we do, and we're on the south side of Java on the, on the interstate. I look back northwest, and I think I kind of see something, like, a, like, a, like the beginning maybe a wall cloud or something. And I see a power flash, I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's a tornado on here. Okay, nope. But I wasn't thinking this was a big deal. So then John, Sean, and I drive further south a little bit, and radio reports start coming in that something big has just happened. And so as it turns out, you know, over 130 people are now dead in Joplin, Missouri. And the quite likely some of the people we drove by because we drove to the part of a Joplin that was that was wiped, the, the the area with the WalMarts and the big stores on the south side of Joplin. You know, the reason that 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 particular event sticks in my head is because it was where I was surprised back to where we started this. Because I've never seen a day in which something that should not have happened like that happened. There were so many storms so close together. A new storm should not have developed the way that it did and produced a large, violent tornado the way that that one did, but it did. It gives a shared sense of responsibility, first thing is that, you know, towards each other. It's, it's like an uh, invisible bond, you know, I would say. It is something that transcends gender, race, nationality, ethnicity. You know, and it's it's a bonding experience. That's what I think it is. In the end, we share some invisible connection. And it's a very, very primal feeling, I think, being one with the star. It has happened to me. I was talking about this last night to a, uh, to a close friend of mine in uh, Bangalore. And I was telling her about how there have been times where I would go observing, you know, to a professional telescope. And I would let the telescope run on its own because it's automated. And I would lie down outside on uh, outside looking at the stars. And I, with no emotion, nothing like whatever it is, I'm looking at the stars, just tears start rolling out of my eyes. There's absolutely, I'm not sad, I'm not happy or something for no reason. You, they, they would just roll out of my eyes, they wouldn't stop. It's, 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 it's almost as if it's pulling me. You know, it, it's, I think it's a very, 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 very primitive feeling for a human being. It's almost more primitive than fire, I think. You know, as a living thing, something we have gotten through millions of years of evolution that we see a connection. There's something out there. It's the curiosity. So I, I have no idea why. I think that's what triggers my tears. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's connection. I don't know, but I, I don't feel connected to a super self thunderstorm. I am definitely apart from it, um, but I am, I am watching something that is very alien to me doing its thing, and that's very cool. Yeah, I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to be part of I don't think I could feel to be part of something that if I screw up, it's going to kill me. You know, if I get hit by one of those beautiful bolts, I'm dead. Um, if I make the wrong turn while I'm trying to chase a tornado, I won't be around to share my video with anyone. No, so I don't think it's, I don't feel like I'm part of these systems, but they are systems that exist separate from me, and I enjoy that fact. And, you know, as an environmental historian, you know, I'm sure that even though my, my love of storms is something that's very deep, it's, it's not because of my training. I mean, it comes from someplace else. But I think being an environmental historian and, and studying the history of the built environment may have, may have anything, may have 
led to me thinking about that separation more strongly. Okay, so, so in environmental history, there's kind of this, uh, it's, it's not really a fierce debate, but kind of a little bit of debate as to, uh, between the folks who, who like me, and, and I get this from Donald Worcester, who emphasize there is still actually a nature out there which you can know through science that is very alien to culture. And those folks who argue there is no way of knowing that without it being all about culture. Um, so for me, in some ways, chasing, I suppose, if I was going to really stretch this, uh, would be just more evidence to me that there's a nature out here that we're never going to control, that we're never going to be able to fully understand. Um, we can try to measure it, we can try to do whatever we want to, but there's always going to be a nature out here that is somewhat separate from, from our culture. From that, I mean, let me see what triggers, what happens inside me. I think it's, it's the same thing you feel when you are in love or something like that. It, it is something, it's, it, it's not physical, you know what I mean, but it's, it's a sense of connection. You, you, kind, you, you send a wave from you, it bounces off whatever you're looking at, it comes back and reassures. It's, it's a very spiritual experience, it's, you know, it's out of body experience, that's what I would call it. You know, I mean, so the word rapture would probably describe it you know, very, very clear, you know, clearly. Yeah. And uh, it's something when that happens, you don't want to. It 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 always it's not like you you want to scream but you can't scream. You want to run but you cannot move. It's it's one of those feelings that you know happens. You know you know something happens in your mind. You know, so you you get this intense sense of uh, satisfaction or you know you you reach a higher purpose. You see a higher purpose for the whole thing and everything else becomes insignificant somehow. And when I saw that uh, uh, black totality, I mean, time just stopped. It was just 53 seconds. But those 53 seconds uh, like a, a lifetime of understanding, suddenly, you know, uh, coming to the fore. And I said, this black has so many voices speaking and with such intensity. And in this brightness uh, all around, I never would hear or give words to that, those thoughts. And the black dark moon, that intensity of darkness was the bound, was really yelling and screaming and um, telling tales. And uh, I saw it as mirroring in, in many ways uh, what was within me. Because it's, it's not the light that actually, uh, the sun you see every day in far more, uh, 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 you know, uh, brighter uh, exists. And that doesn't do anything to you. It's that black in the middle that does it all. People say the black does it because it's it's kind of uh, blocking on the light and you suddenly realize how important the light is. But I said, no, no eclipse uh, blocks it, the light. I mean, night has more more dark than uh, an, uh, an eclipse dark. Is that the black suddenly say that uh, I have a voice? I, I I don't think that eclipse was anything I expected. I mean, I've seen a number of total eclipses, but every time it's a fresh uh, statement. Uh, yeah, it's, an, uh, it's a fresh wow. You know, that uh, suddenly when uh, meaning dawns on you, where you understand something, you comprehend something, that eclipse is always a thing that's so unexpected in the sense, yeah, we know there's going to be belly beads, yeah, we know there's going to be, you know, this totality. But uh, we don't know how the churn is going to uh, come in, in your heart when you see it. You don't know which side you're going to see the little, uh, you know, streamers of uh, uh, solar events happening. And uh, more than that, uh, uh, all that is, you know, they're like, uh, they're, they're not the main act. The, the, the birds flying in the opposite direction, the things cooling down, even the blackness coming uh, uh, in the center. Those are all things that you expect. But what you always, always, I think, in all the eclipses I've seen, fail to expect is the impact it makes on you within. That is, that's, 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 that's a new voice every time saying, 
this is it. So, for me, I mean, the obvious link, I think, between the amateur astronomers and the storm chasers would seem to be a sense of this shared experience of the infinite, the transcendent, whatever you want to you know, call it, reclaiming a lost sense of awe, a sense that they are part of something greater, what Vishnu describes, you know, the sense of connection. But what is distinct also, of course, is their understanding of time, um, of, trans, uh, of transformation, of change. Amateur astronomers or astronomers draw great comfort for the, from the unchangeable nature of what they observe. Storm chasers, on the other hand, as we heard, both expect but also dread the uncertainty and mutability that is central to extreme weather. But what perhaps truly separates them is the experience of terror. Almost without exception, every storm chaser I interviewed had had a deeply traumatic experience with a tornado as a child, which resulted either in a burning desire to try and understand the phenomena as a means to ensure future prediction and control, or an equally driving need to come as close as possible to this childhood horror. So to me, it felt like, it feels like, you know, there is a sort of link to all of this, you know, that the images we see and make, the stories we read and write and share will literally define how we see and understand the world. So what I'd like to do is talk through those frames a little bit more. And the first frame I'd like us to think about, If you love Zoom, yeah, there we go. The first one is horror. So a few years ago, I read Eugene Thacker, the philosopher Eugene Thacker's book, In the Dust of This Planet, which looks at the relationship between philosophy and horror, in which among many things, he explores what he calls the unthinkable world. Sorry, I'm just going to turn this volume down a bit and then... So I'm quoting, the world is increasingly unthinkable, a world of planetary disasters, emerging pandemics, tectonic shifts, strange weather, oil drenched seascapes, and the furtive, always looming threat of extinction. In spite of our daily concerns, wants and desires, it is increasingly difficult to comprehend the world in which we live and of which we are a part. To confront this idea is to confront an absolute limit to our ability to adequately understand the world at all. An idea that has been the central motif of the horror genre for some time. So Thacker essentially describes a sort of concentric circle of worlds within worlds. Worlds that are human, non-human, anthropocentric, non-anthropocentric, some misanthropic. And he suggests that one of the great challenges of philosophy today is a comprehension of this world in which we live as being simultaneously both a human and a non-human world. So of these many simultaneous mirror-like worlds, he expands on three. The first is the world for us, or just the world, as he calls it, the world that we know, that we live in, that we read into, that we interpret, that we give meaning to. The second is the world in itself, or the earth. He says this is the earth in an already given state, you know, as we sometimes find it. And then finally is the world without us, or what he calls the planet. And Thacker says that this is at the limit of what defines us as human beings. Spectral and speculative, the planet is neither antagonistic nor neutral. And Thacker holds that the planet is somewhere in between, in a nebulous zone that is at once impersonal and horrific. So it comes down to this. On the one hand, we live in the world, view it through our prism, the world as the world for us. On the other hand, we exist as the world itself, right? The earth, in the way that we are bound to the world just as much as any other living and non-living thing. And Thakta says that it is this binding that gives us the impression of our interconnectedness and of the interconnectedness of all things, human beings being only one type of thing. So the question that he leaves us with is, how do we face the world without us? this unhuman, inhuman world or the planet. Is this even possible? So I found this text to be both you know, interesting and challenging in equal measure, but I'm a little less interested in how he suggests we might face the unthinkable world because I don't really think he articulates it that I can tell you. But I am interested in the ways that he explores what horror reveals about the unthinkable world. 
and in his ideas of reading horror as philosophy and reading philosophy as horror. And he describes this back and forth as a kind of creative misreading, which can actually be very generative. So let's leave Thacker for the moment, but let's stay with the idea of horror and with the unthinkable world. And while we do that, we will switch frames slightly. So I am a huge fan of all things speculative and all things speculative fiction. And um, one of those sections or one of those, one of those uh, collections of books that have stayed with me for a very, very long time now, even though the books, of course, are not that old, uh, is the Southern Reach Trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer. And this is a spectacular piece of eco horror, right, where the natural world is both under threat and threatening. And um, all three books, the plot begins as with many other sci-fi and speculative fiction you know, in the genre, with a first encounter, with a first contact encounter, correct? Except that this encounter is with a zone. This encounter is with an entire landscape, which he calls Area X, the boundaries of which are marked not by a border, but by a shimmer, which keeps expanding. And this shimmer has a strangely, and we later discover horrifyingly, refractive and prismatic effect on everything in its reach. So the first book in the trilogy, Annihilation, is narrated by a biologist on a mission to explore the area. And she records her initial impressions of the abandoned landscape, including a low, powerful moaning audible at dusk. Her team discovers a structure in the earth, an inverted tower reaching deep underground. The biologist is lowered into it. She describes a smell like rotting honey. The walls are covered with words, words that are written or grown, the writing system of some kind of strange fruiting body. She hears a heartbeat. And then she realizes that this structure is a living organism, a horror show of beauty and biodiversity. The biologist leans in close and is sprayed with golden spores, infected. So Vandermeer is at the forefront of writing that people are calling the new weird, the ecological weird, et cetera, because ecology is weird. And a real awareness of what is happening requires a realization of this weirdness, which may well be frightening. And his books offer one possible perspective of what the world might look like if the lines between nature, culture, us, them were not as clearly drawn, and they aren't clearly drawn, right? And I read his books to more clearly articulate this idea of Thacker's unthinkable world. And there's a fabulous quote which I'm going to share with you from, um, I think, Authority, where he says that, would that not be the final humbling of the human condition that the trees and the birds, the fox and the rabbit, the wolf and the deer, reach a point at which they do not even notice us as we are transformed. And Naomi Booth um, has written an article on horror writers and their interest in the changing climate. And she says how annihilation you know, raises the possibility that from this point on, everything we read is a hallucination of sports, you know, a fungal narration. And the biologist's body in annihilation eventually begins to glow and no one returns from Area X. It's a place that colonizes the mind, it ingests bodies. It's also repeatedly described in the text as being pristine in contrast to the polluted world around it. I can no longer say with conviction that this is a bad thing, the biologist declares at the end of Area, uh, about Area X at the end of the novel, not when looking at the world beyond which we have altered so much. So this is nature in spectacular force against humanity, as Booth says. It will not be destroyed by us, nor will it accommodate us. And horror has always played, you know, on this potential for beautiful landscapes to be deadly. And eco-horror adds the sickening twist that we are implicated in the environmental degradation that is now imminently threatened. And she ends with, in the most insidious eco-horror, contamination isn't somewhere out there. It's right here inside your body, seeping under your skin. So this genre of fiction and other materials around it explore a much deeper, darker ecology, right? And indeed, a deeper, darker nature. Because this is not only a nature or ecology that is aware of the interconnectedness of things, but also of their deep strangeness, of their weirdness, and the places that are created by this sort of overlapping, grafting, splicing of these weirdnesses. So having looked at this idea of Thakur's unthinkable world, and then the world as being deep as much as horror does. Uh, let's look now at the second frame, which I have found useful and in fact necessary when looking at the way that we constantly imagine and reimagine the planet, um, as well as our own relationship with it and our future 
on it. So in the current climate, uh, particularly, uh, it seems particularly futile to be making a case for wonder. But wonder has a complicated history, as we all know, uh, tied as it was to the acquisition of knowledge, the age of wonder, etc. But wonder also had more teeth than it does today, and more in common with horror than we might imagine. So I'm going to read now from an article by a wonderful historian of science, Lorraine Dustin, whom I've had the pleasure of working with. And she's written a piece which is called Wonder and the Ends of Inquiry, and I quote, Modern wonder, like many of the traditional passions, has faded from the saturated hues of blood red and lapis lazuli blue to baby pink and baby blue. Wonder, horror, and terror constitute a trio of passions that are unusual in at least three respects. First, all three contain a distinctly cognitive component. In order to feel horror, terror, or wonder, one must first register an anomaly. These are the observant passions which pick out the extraordinary against the background of the ordinary. Second, although all three deserve to be called vehement with respect to their intensity, they are not single-minded. The perceived anomalies that trigger wonder, horror, or terror are so far beyond the usual range of experience that doubt lies with recognition in the mind. These are the I can't believe my eyes, passions, which split the self into skeptic and believer. Third, and most important for my purposes, the anomalies that evoke this trio of passions are violations of order. They are passions of the unnatural. Horror, terror, and wonder are triggered when a major disruption of order, whether moral, natural, or both, is registered as such. So an act of perception and judgment presumes some acquaintance with the particular sort of orderliness that has been breached. So as the phrase goes, something isn't right. And she concludes by saying, subterranean connections bind the passions of the unnatural to each other. Genevieve Lloyd in her book on reclaiming wonder after the sublime focuses on wonder's less obvious features, right? So the way in which wonder challenges ideals centered on certainty. Wonder in many of its forms depends on, but also thrives on the absence of certainty. So she goes on to say how even in our own times, or particularly in our times, there is a growing popular interest in astronomy and cosmology. So just this past week, for instance, you know, my Instagram feed, my news feed is filled with you know, the new James Webb telescope, right? And how it might potentially rewrite modern astronomy, modern cosmology. So she talks about how that strengthening of wonder at the immensity of the universe is also coming at a time of increased awareness of the fragility of life under changing conditions. Wonder at the immensity of the universe can bring a sharper sense of the fragility of what is near. So here I'd like to share a work which looks at exactly this sense of both immensity and proximity, if you like, fragility as well as. So there is this another wonderful philosopher, Hans Blumenberg, who spent his life studying the sky. And he has this monumental text, which is called The Genesis of the Copernican World. Um, and what he describes is, uh, there is a, I mean, the, the text covers many, many things. It's a fabulous piece of work. But there is one particular chapter where he's talking particularly about how Conspiracy theorists disbelieve the moon landing, right? So he describes how everything about the moon landing, from the footprints on the moon's surface to the flag, which apparently is fluttering in a non-existent atmosphere, wrongly positioned streaks of light, everything could be explained by these theorists, right? Who argued what? That the moon simply wasn't alien enough. Everything but one image, this image, the photograph of the Earth taken from the surface of the moon. And as Blumenberg says, Above the lifeless desert of something that had once had an unattainable quality of a star, the seemingly living star, the Earth. So this image of Earthrise, of course, was followed by the image that we all now recognize as being the blue marble image, which was taken much later um, in 1972 by the crew of Apollo 17 on their way to the moon. But you know, that image again is one of the most reproduced images in history. And at the end of the 1960s, it replaced the mushroom cloud as this global icon of the post-war period. And this view of Earth from outer space was an event of historical importance. It transformed our consciousness and made us think about the Earth's ecosystem as a single planetary unit. Our present as well, as shown by the climate debate, is shaped by this notion of one planet. So this uh, image, which is also one of the most highly downloaded images on Flickr. 
So in 2014, um, I was able to travel with uh, an amateur astronomer, Ajay Talwar, to a fabulous observatory in South India, which is called Gauri Bidnur. And it's a radio telescope array near Bangalore, which is operated jointly by the Raman Research Institute and the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And the observatory has different kinds of radio telescopes. And one of them is this, it's the decameter wave, wave radio telescope. So these are the poles hold these telescopes. These are telescopes. And then they have newer telescopes, which are these ones here, which are called radio heliographs, which are used to obtain two-dimensional images of the outer solar corona. So I'll leave you to watch a few more minutes of this. But just before that, I think what I'd like to share really is that Atmospheres offers an alternative perspective of this iconic photograph of the blue marble. So in the work, you see the Earth, but from our position on the ground. So the sky becomes a mirror, and with the camera lens pointed at the zenith, you see the shifting frames of sky and cloud, crisscrossed by the thin black line, which could be, you know, sort of strange, almost latitudes and longitudes. But there are these radio telescopes, the decameter radio telescopes, or your, it's framed by the radio heliographs of the Gauri Bhumi Observatory. Sara Ahmed, on the other hand, in her book, The Cultural Politics of Emotions, has said that the expansion of wonder is bodily. And I'm going to quote because I just absolutely love her sort of description of wonder and the ways in which she thinks about it. And I quote, the philosophical literature on wonder has not focused on wonder as a corporeal experience, largely because it has been associated with the sublime and the sacred as an affect that we might imagine leaves the materiality of the body behind. But for me, the expansion of wonder is bodily. The body opens up as the world opens up before it. The body unfolds into the unfolding of a world that becomes approached as another body. This opening is not without its risks. Wonder can be closed down if what we approach is unwelcome or undoes the promise of that opening up. But wonder is a passion that motivates the desire to keep looking. It keeps alive the possibility of freshness and vitality of a living that can live as if for the first time. This first timeness of wonder is not the radical present, a moment that is livable only insofar as it is cut off from prior acts of perception. Rather, wonder involves the radicalization of our relation to the past, which is transformed into that which lives and breathes in the present. Wonder energizes the hope of transformation and the will for politics. 
Wonder as an affective relation to the world is about seeing the world that one faces and is faced with as if for the first time. What is the status of this as if? To see the world as if for the first time is to notice that which is there, is made, has arrived, or is extraordinary. Wonder is about learning to see the world as something that does not have to be, as something that came to be over time and with work. As such, wonder involves learning. So I'd like to conclude now with one of the ways I try and bring these two frames, horror, which I extend into the realm of the speculative and wonder together. So I think the reason why I am, have always been drawn to the speculative um, is that it allows many visions of the future, right? Not bound by any sort of linear progression. It allows you to think about ways of looking and understanding the world without being rooted in a present. And if wonder thrives on uncertainty, as Genevieve Lloyd says, then the speculative thrives on the improbable, which as many people have argued is the state of the world today. That moment when the unexpected comes in and forces you to pay attention, you know, turning something on its head, asking the question, what if? That is the basis of all speculative fiction. And even if you look at the word speculative, within which you look at specular, specular means having the properties of a mirror. And I really like the analogy of a mirror in this context, not only because it references both microscope and telescope, modes of seeing, you know, which have the ability to reveal as well as to distort, but also because when you mirror something, it is reversed, right? And that reversal sometimes is enough to make something very familiar, very strange. So some, something that I'm very interested in is how one way of gaining new perspectives on a problem is to juxtapose it with something completely unrelated. And again, this idea of making familiar things strange. So if you take Thacker's construct of the planet at its position at the limits of human imagination and thought, could we suggest that wonder might be another way to look as if for the first time, as Sarah Ahmed has suggested, and further, where wonder is about seeing the world as if for the first time, the speculative asks you to take that and turn it on its head again and then say, what if? And I think these questions take us in very different directions when we look at what we expect from human planet, human non-human relationships. So for me then, stranging becomes a strategy for encountering, observing, and finally recording both environment and experience. Stranging as a practice explores the interconnectedness of our relationship but often offers perspectives that might be useful also. Um, that when you walk the fine line between wonder and the uncanny or the strange or the horrific, it can change how we see the world. So I'll end just with a new work that was produced this year, which is a, a film. I'm only showing you a very short part because it's 10 minutes long. And anyway, it's best not to show you the whole thing, but this is called Glasshouse Deep. And it's a journey into the minute world of the strange deep where the very small also assumes a planetary scale.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was really, really amazing. I was wondering if you could talk us through the film that you just showed a little bit, like the process of uh, making it and a little bit more, because it was um, very well received. We actually had a comment in the chat, which says stunning feels like the deep sea and the tonic tree converging. So maybe we need a, a bit more expansion on the film. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. Um, yeah, so this was actually uh, just commissioned for the Busan, by the Busan Biennale for the Sea Art Festival, just this edition of it. Uh, and uh, the curator, who's a wonderful woman, Ritika Biswas, she, so I work a lot with video feedback. It's another sort of big chunk of the work that I do, which is looking basically at processes of emergence, um, uh, you know, how pattern emerges out of processes of chaos. So just to give you a little bit of a sort of background, video feedback is sort of like the acoustic, it's like the equivalent of acoustic, it's the video equivalent of acoustic feedback, right? So when you have a mic next to a speaker and you get that weird sound that goes back and forth, video feedback is what happens when you take a camera, you plug it into a TV. So if I point the camera at you, your face comes on the TV, right? But if I point the camera at itself, so it's looking at itself, it's like two mirrors facing each other. You get an infinite number of reflections. So if you control the ambient light and you control the settings of the TV and the camera, then a point of light is fed in a loop between the camera and the TV. And this loop of light can generate extremely complex and pattern behavior depending on what you do with it. So it's a very embodied process. If you just hold the camera, nothing will happen but you can do very interesting things. So uh, it's like a really interesting exercise in understanding morphology. Uh, it's hugely chaotic, but what happens is I add mirrors at right angles to the TV so that I can basically then generate fractals. And then this material is then stitched together into other things. So Glasshouse Deep was basically taking the work with video feedback, which is interested in this kind of mirroring between the digital and the biological one step further. And what Ritika was able to do was put me in touch with scientists at the Korean Institute for Marine Biology. And I was, they, they were working on diatoms and they were looking at diatom seasonal migration patterns in the South Korean Sea. And diatoms are really interesting as well. Diatoms are pretty incredible actually, because apart from, apart from the fact that they are responsible for almost 70% of the oxygen on the earth, much more than forests for that matter, they are also really strange little things. So these are, Diatoms are like minute plants, right? Hence glasshouse deep. The idea that you're looking at a glasshouse, but it's a glasshouse of the very minute, of the very small. So single-celled algae are diatoms, right? And like plants, they control, they convert sort of a sunlight into energy. But unlike plants, they also have a urea cycle, which is something that they which is something that they share with animals. And it's really weird, right? So there are these amazing chimeric sort of creatures. And what people think is that they probably inherited this through some sort of horizontal gene transfer from some other either form of bacteria or something. Anyway, so apart from the fact that they are incredibly chimeric, they have the most spectacular skeletal silica structures. They are called the jewels of the deep. They are called living opals because they are incredibly photochromatic and they have this spectacular patterning. So I was interested in putting these two things together. I was interested in also playing with light and also exploring light as a central protagonist because the intensity and spectral quality of light induces migrations in diatoms, which is what I found out through uh, working with these scientists in Korea. But video feedback is also exactly the same thing, right? Video feedback is essentially light that is fed in a loop between these two machines. They're like ghosts in the machine, right? They create these incredible pattern behavior and this dynamic flow of light between the camera and the monitor. 
So you get these, you know, like sort of radiating pinwheels, you get starbursts, you get things that look like bacteria, that look like snowflake. Yeah, so essentially the film, um, whoever said that comment has hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I was going for. I was sort of interested in sort of having these kind of, um, what is the word? You know, I was looking at migrations, speculative migrations, which were both vertical as well as sort of horizontal that would telescope inwards and outwards. So you would have these kinds of, uh, each of these um, diatoms, the photographs have been uh, used, the photographs were taken by the scientists at the Korean Institute of Marine Biology, which, which was fabulous. It was wonderful to be able to work with them and develop this collaboration. It's overlaid with uh, layers of video feedback, right? So basically it's like, um, so what you happen is this kind of, each organic entity is then layered with this kind of temporal material as well, which is light. And then it, then this stuff happens. That is a very long answer to a very short question. Yes, but I was, um, I'm very happy. Also, wait, the sound. So I was thrilled because I'm obsessed with Gustav Holt's Planets. It is the most fabulous uh, album. It's just fab. I think it was nine, I can't remember now. I'm going to forget the date, of course, but he's done this most beautiful album of music there's Jupiter, there's Mars, there's Venus, there's Saturn and Uranus. And I was able to find one recording of this, which is in the public domain. The music is in the public domain, but of course the recordings are not. But this recording is in the public domain. So I was able to play with that. So I feel like that also brings um, the planetary and the sub subterranean. It's not quite the subterranean, sub whatever, the deep together. Yeah. Yeah, no, great answer. I like the level of detail for sure. Um, I'm sure everyone else did also. Um, there's just one other um, question I'd like to ask myself, like quite selfishly, before passing on to the um, audience. Um, in one of our private clips, we discussed how um, the future perfect might need to um, go against the perceived oneness of nature. This is a quote actually by Ro here. Um, so that um, the, uh, um, tends to perceive nature as a, as a whole, as a, as a tranquil um, entity. And so when you speak of horror and of wonder, is there, is, do you think that it is playing into this um, going against the oneness of nature? Or do you think actually that these practices um, maybe are implying the opposite? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think there is a, a one, I mean, I'm not sure actually, maybe, maybe, I mean, you know, if Rohit could tell me more about what the oneness here means. I do think what is interesting about uh, the way in which this, the, these readings of nature allow is that it is hugely messy. It is hugely chaotic. It is hugely, um, so, you know, not just layered, but also I think there are sort of, you know, I like that. I, I like what uh, this sort of idea of, uh, what is it called? You know, that kind of Russian doll model where you've got, natures within natures within natures. I do think it's very much about, I mean, I think with a lot of- Matryoshka doll. Uh, that's it, Matryoshka doll. Matryoshka doll, yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, it's like one of those, I think it depends on how deep you choose to go, which angle, which, which perspective you decide to follow. Uh, I think I'm very interested in this idea of um, uh, an, a not passive nature and a nature that looks back at you, you know, a, a nature or a landscape that is not, yeah, that is not quiet. That is not because it isn't. You know, I just think that um, that's just something that we have either. I mean, on the other hand, you know, there is. I mean, uh, Jay Anfield, the environmentalist, who's also the storm chaser, also talks about how um, these are also constructs that we have imposed on on everything around us for some level of order, right? So there is that sort. Of, I think these are constructs, though. But I think what I love about uh, the Southern Reach trilogy, and I highly recommend it, is that it is uh, deeply uncomfortable when you start to think about how actually those borders are really porous and how very, very disturbing that might become. But if you, I mean, I highly recommend the film also, by the way, it's on Netflix. Annihilation is on Netflix. It's very different, but it's, um, it's worth watching. Deeply terrifying. Fair warning. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Um, so I think now we'll open up to uh, questions if anyone wants to write anything in the chat or if anyone wants to unmute themselves uh, or raise a hand. Rohit. And Jessica, just, I just wanted to say like also just uh, thank you so much for moderating this, but uh, the YouTube, uh, there might be some comments on the YouTube as well as the, we're on both, if you don't mind uh, uh, having a look, so, yeah.
Okay, uh, maybe I, I can start with a question that was a brilliant pre presentation. I thank you for um, all. It's a very simple question, I guess. Uh, I wanted to start with the question about sound um, and scale. Okay, so that's, you know, so I'm interested in sound uh, a lot. Uh, why I'm interested in sound is because, uh, you know, especially in, in, in so-called these times of uh, uh, catastrophe in front of us constantly, um, it was a living catastrophe. We have people dying um, who are close to us. Uh, um, what does it mean? Uh, and sound always felt for me to be uh, uh, something that allowed me to abstract from the personal catastrophe or like the witnessing of death, right? Uh, or the experience of death. Um, and you're dealing with such huge, like what I love about your work is that you're dealing with such big scales in such intimate ways. And sound is really, really important to you. And I love that about your work. I've, I've been remiss. I've been traveling quite a bit uh, uh, with your with your course um, with Bicar, but um, sound is always there. And today we saw that too. Um, uh, what is it about? Like, how, can, can you just say something um, more pointed about, uh, uh, or more specific about how you think about catastrophe at an extraordinarily planetary level, like an extraordinarily sort of immense level and at such an intimate level which is what your work captures so beautifully and and, um, and it's sort of maddening at the same time you know so um if you could just it's a it's a stupid sort of question slash comment sorry so what's maddening the, the fact that you're able to play with scales and oh no i think no it's sound, a good question uh, yeah uh, um uh, sound which is abstract of course um huge planetary scales and then like but it's it's just talk us through your process of, of working yeah. across such scalar immensity um yeah i think um actually it comes basically down to what you sort of said i don't actually i this is the this is the truth right i feel like um i find a sort of a state of constant crisis or this kind of constant catastrophization, not, I find it completely paralyzing. So for me, um, I think the way to do it is to go small and to come close and to come into people. Because for me, whether it's the amateur astronomer or whatever, they become sort of like the beacon, not the beacon, they become the people which I'm able to read this material. Because it's one of those things, you know, I feel like if the catastrophe was here right now, I wouldn't be able to make art. Do you know what I mean? I, I mean, I know the catastrophe is here, but at some level, I need that level of, um, I don't know if I'm making um, any sense here, but I feel like there has to be movement. There has to be the, the, the place for a, a little bit of all of these things, you know, like Sarah Ahmed even talks about the importance of hope. I think there has to be space for wonder. There has to be space for just those moments of hope, of joy. Because otherwise, I just feel like, like, you know, I wouldn't be able to do anything. It would just be really hard. I think sound, it's a really, it's a good question because it's, it has become increasingly uh, more, um, more a sort of um, a figure in itself. And I think maybe that actually began with the interviews with the amateur astronomers. Because, you know, it's like when you hear, there's a sound piece called Shadow Walkers, which is just about the eclipse. And when I was doing the interviews, I realized then you can't image this. You know, like Glenn Schneider says, you can't share. I mean, of course you can, right? I mean, I have images of solar eclipses. But the minute when you listen to Raj talking about a black shining, you can't. There's something that happens in your mind. Like, you, know, you keep going back to these stories. So sometimes sound just works on a really, on a level that sort of punches you. It's, it's a different register, no? It's a very strange kind. It's like yeah, smell, I, I imagine. Yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying. So, I, I, yes, no, I, I appreciate that. But it's like, it's almost sort of like, but... Like, uh, but how, how, so the question I think then becomes like, uh, how do you see, how do you hear a catastrophe at such a massively scalar level, which I see in your work. I'm just trying to figure out what, <laughs> how, 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 how you, that's why I like I don't, work, the, you know, the thing like, is, I don't so how, see how, it. Where, where, <laughs> can you tell me what you've done because, uh, or tell us what you've done, it would be very helpful because I, I, it's very hard to do like 
you're, I, I completely agree. With I don't actually see it, so this would be great. I mean, I, I think like you can see something in it. Like when you say, "Hear the catastrophe on a scale," do you mean? I mean, I have no idea. I don't see it. I really don't. Like, I don't even think I'm thinking of that when I'm making the work. So it's really cool. We should have a conversation about that because I, either you should you have to tell me more. You have to tell me what you're seeing because I don't see it. In my own work, I mean, maybe well, I, I see break. I, I see breaks. Like I see, I see interruptions. At but imagine seeing an interruption at like in the sky, right? You know, um, and that's that's what I see you presenting through your right. your, yeah. your typical sort of mm -hmm. uh, uh, conversation between subterranean and superterranean yeah. um, mm -hmm. images. Uh, I see interruptions. I see break beats, uh, and I know why. I think I know why sound is so important to you. Mm -hmm. um uh like i think it's a very interesting uh like conclusion in a certain way to to our our public workshop I mean, or colloquium to to to, to 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 think about the idea of catastrophe um in 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 a in a, in a, in a radically productive way right uh uh it's beautiful. I mean, uh, like, how, how, how do you register? Like, imagine like a night sky, like Hegel says this, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I started philosophy. Uh, I'm a philosopher. So I started philosophy in the pitch dark of the night. Mm -hmm. And I saw a cut. I saw a cut in the night. How do you see a cut in the night? And, 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 and you know, uh, that 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 that's something that I feel like you're doing. I just I I, I want I want you just to processually sort of uh, yeah yeah. No, I'm glad you question. you you brought up Hegel because this is that uh, there's this amazing um, story which of course I will not be able to find, so I'm just going to have to skip all this. But uh, there is a story that he met um, another philosopher, and the other philosopher was waiting for him, and he was looking up at the night sky and he was gazing into the night sky, and then I think Hegel puts his arm his hand on his shoulder, and then he says, "It is not the stars that matter, but what we read into them." So I feel like a lot of the work that is coming from here and even, so it, it, we could say that it begins or it began with my own journey as being, you know, an amateur astronomer because I joined the group the same year that I joined the College of Art in Delhi. So it's really like a 20, how many years is that? It's a long time. It's like 25 years of being both, right? But I feel like um, even my first encounter with both, it was, it's always been both. I think this is what it is. Like even the first event, which was a solar eclipse that I couldn't see because it was totally clouded out. The longest eclipse of the century, completely clouded out, standing on the Patta Planetarium. It's completely dark, it's raining, um, it's pitch black. Everybody's screaming because there's either silence or euphoria. There's nothing in the middle. There's no middle ground in a solar eclipse. But even then it was, it was both. It was on one hand this sense that you're on a, a star. The Earth is a star. You're on a star in space and you're in the, at the conjunction of these three huge bodies, you know, the sun, the moon and the Earth. But at the same time, you're in the midst of this group of people. So for me, I don't know if this is answering your question and maybe I think it's something I, I, I would, I'm going to think about a little bit more. But it's always it was that chaos of people yelling and screaming uh, and howling or laughing because that's what happens. But it's also this complete... Um, the silence that also, you know, that, that comes with the eclipse. So it's a little bit of both, I feel. Yeah, that doesn't answer the question. But yes, I do think it's well, very... Well, it wasn't really a question. It was, it was a wonder. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so I appreciate it. So, yeah. No, but also it's Absolutely. just a simple thing like um, the fact that Delhi doesn't have a night sky anymore. You know, like eight, the, 10 years ago when I joined the amateur astronomers, we could do observations from the planetarium in Delhi. Now to get low threshold skies, which means reasonably dark skies, you have to drive 10 hours out of the city. That's deeply, that, that, that is deeply worrying for me. You know, the fact that that, that kind of pollution is not even on our horizon. Ah. The idea that you might grow up without so, the stars. Okay, so here I want, okay, and I'm going to stop after this because, uh, the, but here, this is where I want to intervene. It's like what I think is so interesting about your work um, and, and is, that, is that it doesn't matter. Like the, it's so non anthropocentric Anthropocene, right? It's it's uh mm. it's not about pollution. It's not about uh we can't see the stars. You're making cuts in darkness, right? I mean, and like that that's a really beautiful thing to do. So it's a uh or if I'm thinking with you, right? Like it's uh um it's not like okay, 
there's a cut for us if there is not pollution, you know, then we could see the cut, right? Um, let's get rid of pollution. I mean, what, it, what, what moves me so much about looking at your work, listening to your work, um, is, is, is that, uh, is that you're, you're, it, 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 it's ontological, it's, it, it's creating out of nothing, it's creatio ex nihilo, literally. And I think that's what's really beautiful. So, 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 like, it's a very different, it's a very different discourse, at least from what I'm hearing from the anthropocenic. You know, Delhi is this polluted. Is the it's like, like the sky, we can't see the stars. Like, I want to see the, the. No, no, no. But see, the thing the is, stars shouldn't do the work for us. You're doing that work. You know, like um, whether there's pollution or not. So, and that's the last thing I'll say. And then, thank you just so much for this. Thanks. Just gonna end one thing. I mean, it makes it sound. No, no. I am deeply. deeply terrified and horrified by, by the light pollution and other things. But what is interesting, though, is that if you look at Eco Horror, if you look at Vandermeer, he's also been called sort of the anti-Anthropocene because he's doing exactly that. He's saying if you collapse this, if you make it all, if you, Eco Horror does exactly that. If there is no us in them, then how, then how strange and how weird does it get? So I, I, I do, I take that point and I'm, I'm happy if that is, um, yeah. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Hello, Valerie and Michelle. Hi, Ro. Hello. I'm dropping this. <laughs> I'm dropping this <laughs> poem in the chat, uh, which I read. So the new uh, issue of Strange Horizons um, is actually on friendship. And I was reading oh. this reading it this morning. Yeah, I know. Um, so there is this poem, which is about uh, a very nice poem called The Mismanagement of Stars. And it's essentially just to kind of um, uh, extend uh, from this ongoing discussion about uh, pollution and what do we do, et cetera. So the idea that, I mean, I don't know, like a bold proposition to make for the future, uh, because that's what I guess we're invested in doing, is to also invent new planetary systems, right? Is to invent new star charts, uh, which are not mourning um, the absence of um, access you know, um, but to actually produce a kind of um, a new um, navigation, uh, nav you know, intelligence to navigate um, what, what exists, right? And in that process, also refuse to, in a way, accept, uh, you know, uh, the conditions that have been imposed on us. So it's not like continuously readjusting to the lack of, um, uh, you know, justice as far as these things are concerned, uh, which yeah. is you know, pollution is connected in the air, light pollution, air pollution is connected Absolutely. to justice, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So not become in a way okay with it and by going higher and higher and higher or to cleaner skies or whatever to get the best view of the stars, but to actually be almost, um, um, I don't know, insistent uh, on producing a new intelligence producing new planetary charts that's why I like this poem quite a bit mm -hmm. and it also says that actually originally constellations were invented for sea travel yep. sea travelers right and that's how one read that but now we're if we're many of us have produced a stake in the sky and and I think uh, your work basically allows us to produce new stakes in the sky uh, what do we uh, do with that what do we do with that uh, piece of the sky how do we yeah. make it our own yeah um, so, thank you yeah. B. no that's wonderful and I, I love this poem thank you so much actually you brought up something also which is true because I've only recently discovered the work of another really interesting um, astrophysicist and cosmologist and her name is uh, Chanda Prescott Weinstein and she actually argues for uh, justice exactly what you said she talks about justice and she talks about dark skies and she talks about like I'm just going to read from her because we this on this note you know so freedom dreams under a dark night sky to access one means food security housing security clean water clear skies all of these kinds of things even if you think about just the night sky and what it implies for safety right to be able to congregate under the night sky as groups of amateur astronomers do suggests what that you're able to do that safely without you know, there are all these other things as well. And I also think that something that does bother me is this idea that, you know, yeah, exactly what you said. Um, because I think also it's just a way of reframing it. It's just a question of saying what all the amateur astronomers are fighting for or trying to argue for is that it's not that 
light pollution is something that we can deal with so simply. You just need the lights to throw the light down instead of up at the sky, right? It's simple things like just changing the ways that you think about what is street lighting meant to do? What do you want to light? You don't need to all, uh, you look at any of the street lights in Delhi. I mean, I don't know what it's like in um, Abu Dhabi or in Dubai, but in Delhi, all the street lights are like this, right? So they're fully, they, they illuminate. But what are you choosing to light? And um, yeah, but I, I totally agree with you. And I think that, thank you so much for bringing that up because I do also think that I mean, Delhi particularly, we just have to find, um, I don't think, we, yeah, I don't think it's a question of finding ways to live with this because also I think we have to actively fight, otherwise it's just going to become like from the few, 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 few stars we see to none at all. But thank you. I'm going to keep this. Yeah, let's make our own planetarium. I think that should... <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Well, yeah. That should be the next thing. Yes, Michelle. Hello. Hi. Whoops. Um, so I, I kind of have a three part thought, um, slash question, um, which are all kind of like somewhat related, but, um, maybe it'll get clearer as I, I try to like unpack it. Um, like I think earlier when Rohit asked the question, you were, um, quoting maybe is a Hegel who said that uh, it's not the stars that matters but reading into them mm -hmm. or something along those lines and that kind of relates to my first thought uh, which is that um, like this is kind of like anecdotal so bear with me but I, I was thinking like two years ago there was like the first image of the black hole or whatever and that was like really kind of um, maybe that changed my life. Maybe that's an overstatement. No, but I think so, it was yeah. like thinking that um, it's like not the image itself because it the image looks quite cryptic. Like I wouldn't know what I'm looking at, and plus it's not like the most spectacular image that I've ever seen. But it's like the meaning. Um, yeah, I guess I was trying to say that the, the meaning, the social meaning of that image came first. And then maybe it like provoked any kind of like corporeal reaction that came after that. And I was wondering also about the moon landing image in the same vein and mm -hmm. whether like the posterior circulation of that image in the cultural sphere dilutes the, the um, kind of primal reaction of wonder um, mm. and all these kind of like images as a category um, of like, yeah, like these are really amazing images, but um, like how much is the meaning? Yeah, like, uh, but sorry, amazing meaning that like the, the first image of the black hole like is significant um, but the content of the image, I can say that it's like the most kind of awestrucking mm -hmm. that I've ever seen. So like that's the kind of the first um, thought. And related to that, um, I was thinking that uh, the work about the amateur astronomer unpacks wonder in a similar vein as your presentation, which is to kind of reveal these accounts of wonder that we can all relate to rather than kind of putting on display a scene of wonder. Um, and so I was curious whether maybe like the goal of the artwork is to trigger some kind of wonder or to deconstruct how the, this category of passion works because um, I'm a little skeptical of like artwork to kind of uh, trigger the same reaction that I, when I'm faced with a natural phenomenon. Um, and then the third kind of, the last thought was just, um, I was curious about something that came up in your presentation, which maybe it was a quote from someone, um, which says uh, something about reclaiming wonder after the sublime and mm -hmm. the extinction between the two. And, like how does artwork function in triggering either? 
in triggering uh, the sublime and wonder. Yeah. Or, I were, um... Yeah. Okay, so I feel like yeah, they're all sort of connected. No, your questions. So I'm mean, the comments and the thoughts. I think I'll answer maybe the second one first, which was the question about uh, what I want people uh, to get from the work. I think um, it's really interesting because I I I feel like actually it's just much more about how I'm reading the environment. If you see what I mean, like I'm reading the environment in a particular way, the way that I read it. Uh, may generate many different things. Like um, there are many works. Uh, I don't think all of them generate wonder. I don't actually think I think about what, to be honest, I'm not sure that I want people to be, I don't want wonder to be elicited as much as just a change in perspective. I feel like that's far more the intention with actually all the work because um, whether it's the work that is uh, more print based, which is looking much more at these kind of nature as camouflage sort of, you know, where the botanical crosses over into the uh, other sort of, you know, realms, whether it's about site specific drawings that are much more destabilizing in spaces. So when you walk in, there is a sense of, you know, being destabilized, whether it's works that are derived out of sites. I think for me, what ends up happening very often is that um, all of the work is generated from some kind of some kind of engagement with a site, with some form of an observation. The nature of those observations vary from um, those that come out of astronomical uh, either experiences. So either an ex you know uh, the observatory is a very interesting space and a site for me because I feel like there's something about um, telescopes that are also chimeric. You know, I I'm really interested in telescopes. I'm really interested in the physical form of a telescope. Also, I think they're like these weird thing standing in there one thing standing in for something else looking at something else again and as you've already pointed out you know like very often what they're looking at and even what they generate in terms of their own data is not anything that one can immediately make sense of right so whether it's radio telescopes particularly because i've done a lot of work with radio telescopes arrays what is interesting for me and in fact more than interesting it just sort of blows my mind is that they are creating maps of the sky which are not visual you can overlay them on visual maps of the sky and they will show you something else because they are in another spectrum entirely, right? This doesn't really answer your question, but I guess what I'm saying is that hopefully the work, um, if it generates wonder in the audience, that's wonderful. It might generate, some of the work has been deeply disturbing for people. And I'm also very happy when that happens because I feel like basically, I think what, what Lorraine Dastin says, you know, this idea of being slightly of woken up, um, not woken up, sort of you know, just sort of being in a slightly more aware, be what she describes as being this idea of being the observant fashion, whether it's horror, terror. I don't think any of the work necessarily evokes terror in that sense. But if it would be, if it would make you observant, it would just make you look again, that's something that I hope that the work is able to do. Um, sorry, what was the third question? I forget now. Was it uh, the sublime and the thing, no? Now, so this is really interesting. I, in fact, I went, I remember to the, um, was it the ZKM in 2012, and I saw a show which was called Reset Nature, and Bruno Latour had written a text, and he talks about how it isn't possible for the sublime to exist anymore, because we are in the age of the Anthropocene, and for the sublime to be, for, to experience the sublime, you have to have a position of safety, right? And right now there is no position of safety. So we are all implicated in this moment, but it's really interesting. I was just reading up on this again <laughs> and he's given a TED talk not very long ago. I think it was like two years ago and he's talking now about a re-enchantment. He's talking about re-enchantment. He's talking about uh, looking through the sublime again at another way of looking at science. And it's really interesting because it's very close to what um, a lot of the other people I've talked about today are just saying that when you think I don't like, I mean, I'm, see, I'm not using the word sublime, which is why even Genevieve Lloyd in her text is talking about wonder after the, the sublime, right? So if you sort of reclaim sublime from these very imperialist colonial sort of thingies as well, right? I mean, I also feel like these are things that we should all be able to access, we all be able to talk about. And if you, it begins with this body of work, which is coming very much from these amateur astronomers. It's like saying, even the conversation around, um, yeah, just even the idea of religion or when, you know, if you think about words like pilgrimage, if you think about words like rapture in the context of an eclipse chase, they're not out of place, but you, it is possible to use those words and remove them from their history. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if this answers um, 
but it was um yeah i hope this helps oh i'm happy to jump into this again yeah um there's also i just wanted to draw on what you spoke about with the sound recordings and how um the person, sorry, I forget the name, but the person who speaks about the, the darkness and how that conjures up an image in the mind, which far surpasses anything that you'd be able to create visually as an artist. And to me that, that yeah, it draws on wonder, but it also draws on the role of imagination. And when you talk about speculative fiction, but and imagination to me seems like a really big part of, um, of your work and the process of your work, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's Raj. That's Raj Shekhar. Yeah, he, he, um, he's a poet, right? He's a philosopher. He was. Uh, I agree completely. I feel like um, an imagination is also if you look just at the history of imagination and astronomy history, uh, the history of um, the ways in which the imagination was used uh, in a very different way. So if we look at the very first observations of the moon, Right, And if we think about the ways in which Galileo had to use his imagination to make the very unfamiliar, which was the moon, familiar. So it's exactly sort of in the opposite direction of what we've talked about today. But there he, he does something very interesting. The imagination then undergoes a sort of, it becomes a much more creative faculty, where he talks about the dark spots on the lower horn of the moon, like the dark spots on a peacock's tail. You know, There are these beautiful analogies and metaphors that he uses to make something very unfamiliar, familiar. But metaphor has undergone massive changes, oh, sorry, not metaphor, imagination and metaphor, the idea of projection, reading into some things have all undergone changes. And I absolutely agree, imagination is a huge part of, I think all, all creative work, but um, you know, you, you're, I think you also work with speculative sort of, you know, uh, spheres and all of them, I think what's interesting is, as I said, you know, this idea of that good sci-fi, good speculative fiction, will ask these questions that will immediately complicate, not simplify, you know? I feel like that's what's really interesting about um, all of that, yeah. yeah thank you so much. Um, do we have any more questions from anyone in the Zoom room? Uh, I, I had my hand up, but am I, am I next for the queue or is there, no, there's another queue, there's a... I can't see any hands up, so I think you go for it. I think it's Viranga now, but go ahead and go first or whatever. D has also put her hand up. Okay, and then the YouTube, I don't know how to work, but you'll know how to work that, Jessica. You can see the questions. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. no, we're all good on YouTube. Just let me, yeah. So, just, yeah, so whenever you say. Yeah, you go, we'll hit, and then we'll come back. Okay, so um, so this question of wonder and sublimity and uh, horror, um, which uh, Rohini you talked about, um, and you know uh, quite quite wonderfully, and I think show quite wonderfully in your work is really important. I mean, so uh, there's an undecidability, right? There's an under like what you're doing is you're staging an undecide like the moment of undecidability between terror and beauty mm. right and you're compelled like that's the politics of your walk it's not like oh this pollution and the you know like let's clean up the plastic and let's let's touch latour you know like let's let's take like pet forks or you know like and and you know um the the, the I, I see your work as being so radical because it's it's you're you're you're, you're you actually pose the cost you pose the moment of decision uh, at, at the very, like wonder and horror. Like I see this, you know, Lorraine, you know, as, as, as you, you, you think with her quite closely, like that's the, 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 that's the threshold of, of humanity. It's like, um, why we're, 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 um, we're not animals, we don't have instincts, it's because we have to make a decision at precisely that threshold of, um, of the sublime. Kant, for instance, would say, uh, he, he was so scared of that cut, of dancing in that cut of darkness, right? He said, oh no, we need a categorical imperative, right? Like we need to, uh, we need to have a rule of sorts, right? That's somewhere that we haven't found yet. It's certainly not normalized. Like, what does it mean to pose the dance at the cops? And that's 
the dance of, I think, precisely um, the cut, cutting of darkness that you're doing. Um, and that is what sublimity is. And it, 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 it's the border, it's the edge mm -hmm. of, yeah. of terror and beauty. That's what, it's not, it's not beauty, it's not terror. It's, 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 the, it's a space between. And so I just wanted to yeah, no, thank you. I think that's why, you know, I like the idea of stranging because stranging can be, can, can go both ways. No? So if you, I like, that's why I like the idea of something being strange. Strange can very easily tip over both ways. Strange can be deeply horrifying or it can very easily go into something that is not. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Virangana, sorry. I, I, I can see you. Hi. Hey, Roini. Thanks so much for great presentation. I had, um, well, it's a reflection and a question together. Uh, taking from what you said about how the speculative allows for many visions of the future, but also bringing in what Jessica brought in about a certain oneness and how wonder allows us to see the world for the first time. Mm. Uh, I was curious about how you think about interdependency in this because interdependency is a way in which perhaps these various phenomena in nature create multiples that exist in a sort of oneness, but also break away from difference to allow us to think of uh, existing as a collective of sorts, perhaps. And where interdependency comes in for how you think through your work. So do you mean interdependency between? Phenomena in nature. No, I think they are deeply, I mean, you know, interdependent, also contingent on, either, on each other. So I think, yeah, I would say that I probably think about that as being deeply uh, interdependent. But I think what uh, I would just extend that maybe just to add that that interdependence is something that maybe as, see, I'm going to keep going back to a lot of this other material because I feel like some of this maybe is just beyond Delib not deliberately, but perhaps it's beyond our own threshold of what we understand as being interdependent, if you know what I mean? Like it's what Jay Antel says, where maybe there is a point beyond which either we have to change frames of reference completely because we keep reading it within a frame of reference that we have bound, right? And that keeps shifting, that keeps changing. So what, are we, what do we mean when we say interdependency now? What are we talking about and what... what so basically, I think like, for instance, I'll give you an example. I'm going to keep jumping to speculative fiction. There is an amazing, uh, I think it's a short story or it's a book. It's called Vaster Than the Vaster Than the Empire and More Slow by Ursula Le Guin. And she talks about an entire planet, right? And the entire planet is the sentient being. It's like Solaris. The, the ocean planet, it's like the ocean entity in Solaris. And in both cases, the people who go to investigate them can't get their heads around it because they have no frame of reference for an entity or an organism that exists in this shape, fashion, or form. Um, I think this is what I mean when I say that when you start to think in these terms, I think it automatically opens up a whole other way of, you know, if you think in terms of, again, let's look at, um, again, Vandermeer's, he's written a book called Dead Astronauts. And there's an entire chapter, chapter from the perspective of a blue fox. Do you know what I mean? Like it is another one where just the mushroom talks. So there are just these ways, I think, in which what we, I mean, fungus, you can think about, there's entire texts that are written about how interesting fungi are and all that sort of stuff. So I think I think about interdependence as absolutely, I don't even, but maybe I wouldn't use the word interdependence. Maybe I would just say fully entangled. You know, I think it's much more messy. I think it's really, you know, and not in a bad way. I think it is the nature of these things. I think it is deeply entangled. I think it is very, um, yeah. So I'd go with entangled instead of, yes, that's not. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Do we have anyone else with their hands up? I apologize for not being able to see the hand function. No? Uh, and we are all um, good on YouTube also. So I think um, it's time to just say a huge thank you. I found the whole talk so 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 interesting um and thank you for your inputs really and your feel, feedback thank you yeah i feel very very blessed to have shared this space with you so thank you so much and very sad that this is our last our last public uh talk so thank you everyone yeah thank and you so much thank evening. you jessica thank you Rohit. thank you Maze. thank you pallavi thank you Virangana. thank you for everyone
Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ro. It was brilliant. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for holding the, the, the shit. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, Ro, really great, phenomenal talk. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye, Dean. <laughs>